everybody. My name is uh, Aaron Valmers. Uh, I've been working all over the world for the last 30 years, uh, working with some of the big blue chip companies, um, as well as lots and lots of small businesses uh, and some medium sized businesses as well. So can I just ask you as a sh with a show of hands, just quickly to understand who's in the room. Um, how many of you here actually run a business? You're, you're either a salon owner uh, or you um, are at the supply end, you, you ma manufacture something or produce something. How many of you actually are owners in the business? Okay. Um, all right, so does that mean the rest of you are actually working in the, these kind of businesses in the industry? Yeah? Okay, terrific. So for those of you who own your own businesses, I think this um, conversation, hello. That's okay. Uh, this conversation with you, um, and I'd like to, um, uh, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to try and tell you all I'm, I, I've learned over 30 years in about 30 minutes, okay? So uh, wish me luck. But the, um, this, I think from, from the salon owner perspective or the business owner perspective, this is going to be really interesting because I'm hoping it's going to change the way you think about running your business. For those of you who work in those businesses, there's something in this for you as well. Um, I'm hoping you're going to go back to the businesses and actually start really, really provoking how the people in your business think about running their business, okay? So, um, over the course of the 30 minutes, I'm going to invite you to think about what you might do with uh, some lottery winnings. So I'm going to ask you to imagine you've won the lottery, like a big, big sum of money, right? And I'm looking around the room, I can see you're all far too young to retire. So you're not allowed to retire, that's not an option. You're going to, I'm going to ask you to think about how you might uh, invest your lottery winnings. Um, I'm going to I invite you to come play some tennis with me. And then I'm going to show you why all of that might be interesting and relevant to the businesses that you run. So I'm also going to hopefully give you uh, a, a really simple four-step uh, framework, if you like, for thinking about how you might run your business. And I've also got an example, if we have time at the end of this, I've also got an example of, of a, a beauty or a spa and beauty business that actually is already implementing. This is a company in the UK. Uh, I know of one at least in the US as well. They're already using these ideas very successfully in their business. So I'm going to try and see if we've got some time to share that with you. And hopefully we'll just take a couple of your questions at the end. And certainly I'll be hanging around uh, afterwards um, if you'd like to speak. I'll be very uh, happy to do so, and I'll probably stick around for lunch. So come and find me if there's something interesting for you to talk about as well. Okay. So this is me. Um, I run a company called 90 Days, as I said. And 90 Days really does, uh, I, I do, amongst a whole bunch of other things, I work with uh, businesses to introduce what I call ownership thinking. Okay, so what is ownership thinking? Ownership thinking is, is, is aimed at, at um, addressing the issue in most businesses, which is actually how do we get everybody in your business coming to work every day, thinking, feeling, and acting as if they own that business? Okay, so if you manage to get everybody in your business coming to work every day, thinking, feeling, and acting as if they own business, do you think that might make a difference to the way in which your business might perform? Okay, so that's kind of the contention. And I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I can tell you unequivocally it does. But that might not be good enough. Let me kind of illustrate the point. So the first thing I want you to do is imagine uh, you've won the lottery. As I said, a very, very nice, handsome sum of money, but you're not allowed to retire. Okay? So I'm going to ask you a question, and I want a show of hands. Nobody's allowed to sit on the fence here. You have to pull up your hand one way or the other. Okay? So I want you to imagine two identical businesses, whether they be spa and beauty businesses or manufacturing business, you know, product business, whatever the case might be. And these are two identical businesses. Okay? But they are separated by one thing. There's only one thing that's different about these two businesses, and this is it. In company A, everybody comes to work every day thinking, feeling, and acting as if they are employees. And in company B, everybody comes to work every day thinking, feeling, and acting as if they are owners of the business. They don't actually own the business, but they come to work thinking, feeling, and acting as if they own the business. So here's the question. With your hard-earned lottery winnings, okay, which business would you buy? Oh, well, I want to show of hands because I don't want anybody sitting on the fence here. Right, who's going to invest in A? Put up your hands right now. Not one person? Well, there's always one person in the room. They're usually the accountant, by the way. Okay. Okay, so not, not one person there. Okay, what about company B? I want to make sure that you're all in this with me. Okay, company B, everybody. All right, now here's the important question. Tell me why. And by the way, I asked this question dozens of times um, over the course of any uh, year, and I always get the same response, right? So you're in good company so far. So don't get worried, don't get nervous. I'm going to keep asking you some questions through the, throughout the session. So you're in good company, but why? Why would you invest in company B? What do you know about company B? 
Right, so you expect that people who come to work every day thinking, feeling, and acting as if they own the business will hold themselves accountable. They'll act more responsibly, and take more responsibility for what they do. Okay, and you'd be right. What else? More passion. More passion in the business, right. And probably you'd be right in that too. More innovation. More innovation. And that's really something that's missing from most businesses, by the way. So I'm glad to see you saying that. And I think that certainly is my experience. What else? I think it would be interested in something more than the job. Right. So more than the job is worth, is it? That kind of idea. So you, you're going to care a bit more. Okay, yes, you're right. Okay, what else? All thinking about profit. Right, okay. So the financial thing, right? That big dirty word called money, right? Absolutely. So they might pay attention to whether your company is more profitable, whether they're making any money, whether you might be growing, those kinds of things. Okay. Now, we could go on. I've only got 30 minutes, so I'm going to kind of cut it over there, right? Um, what about uh, the second question is, which company would you rather work in? Because there's a mixture of owners and business owners here, as well as people who work in these companies. Which of these companies do you, would you rather work in? Who would rather work in this company, company A? Put up your hands. <coughs> no one again. Okay, that's interesting. There's usually always one. Okay. What about company B? Put up your hands. I want to see if you're not sitting on the fence. Who's going to work in company B? There's one or two people not putting up their hands because they're not quite sure where the hell this is going. All right. But, all right. So most of you actually would prefer to work in company B, but tell, uh, tell me why. What would you expect to find if, as an employee in company B? More reward. Sorry? More reward. More reward? More rewarding? Yeah? OK, how so? Because you're kind of you've invested in it personally, professionally, so I think you'd find more reward. OK, so you, you, you feel more invested in the business, right? OK, and therefore it might be more rewarding. Yes, please. Voice could be heard. Right, so you might actually get listened to, right? OK, how many of you are sitting here going, I know how to solve some of these problems that we deal with every day? But they don't ask me. Sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. You've, that's the kind of conversation that happens in the canteen, in the sort of you know the staff rooms, uh, in the coffee shops. Afterwards, going, my God, we could fix that, but they just don't care, right? Now, of course, that's not really true. Just maybe there's some other reasons why they haven't quite gone to that sort of level. Okay, so you might actually get asked, and you might actually be able to contribute. What else? Any other reasons? You might be more appreciated in the business because you might contribute some innovative ideas, all those kinds of things, right? Okay, and again, we could kick this around for a little bit. But let me tell you, actually, if you look at the research done on this, and there's lots and lots of research done about this in, in, uh, in businesses all over the world. If you look at the research, actually, the research actually suggests you're right. Okay, so businesses that operate in this way, businesses that actually uh, get everybody coming to work every day, thinking, feeling, and acting as if they own the business, grow faster, they're more profitable, they're more sustainable, in other words, they last longer, they stick around much longer, okay? There's only one downside that we can find, and that is people in those who work in those businesses tend to live longer. So it takes a, it takes a hit on, it hits the, the pension plan, if you like, okay? So pretty much the in evidence, the empirical evidence actually suggests you guys are right. So what's really interesting for me here is that your intuition, okay, I don't know, did any of you, have you, any of you read the research on this? Okay, so I'm assuming there's nobody who's actually done their homework and read the research on this because you didn't know I'm, I'm, I'm the replacement speaker today, right? <laughs> so you, didn't, you had no insight of what was coming here, so you couldn't even cheat. So your intuition, your gut feel suggests that running a company like this company, where everybody, you know, if we could run a company like this, that would be a much better thing to do. The research actually says you're right. So here's the question. Why is it, if it's so obvious, and the research suggests that it's, it's, it's a better way to run a business, why are, isn't every business run like that? Because would you agree with me that every business, most like your business, pretty much most businesses are run like this? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, is that, you're not sure? You're right? Okay, but here's the killer question, of course. Why is your business still run like company A? Okay? Okay, good. If you're telling me it's not, I'm going to check, well, check up on a few things with you, but you probably, yeah, hopefully you're, you're right there. Because the chances are your business will outperform pretty much all your competitors if you've got it right, yeah? Okay, so that's the first thing. So I want to leave you with that, 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 that question you had. If actually we could create a company where everybody came to work every day thinking, feeling, and acting as a, if they owned the business, what difference would it make to the way in which our business performed? And more importantly, what difference would it make, or as importantly, what difference would it make to the way in which everybody comes to work every day? Okay, would that actually mean, you know, a greater level of engagement, a, you know, a great, probably lower staff turnover, uh, better retention rates, all those kinds of things, and perhaps even just the way your staff feel about uh, working in your business. And the one thing we do know, right, happy staff, happy customers, right? Happy customers, happy profits. Yes, yeah, not the other way around, right? The customer isn't king. Your staff, 
the staff are the most important thing. Look after your staff, they'll look after your customers. Look after your customers, then the profit kind of takes care of itself generally. Okay, so that's the first point I want to make. But how do you create an organization like that? So in order to illustrate that to you, I want to I invite you to play tennis with me. Okay, so first question, who plays tennis here? Who knows anything about tennis? Anybody, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to explain that. You're not, you don't, you're not, you're not stringing you out here. Has anybody ever played tennis here? Okay, a few of you. See, look, a bunch of lies in the room here. No? <laughs> okay, so a bunch of you play tennis. So how many of you actually know the rules of tennis and you know, understand the, what the court looks like and all those kind of things? So, probably a few of the group of the pe people we would have put up their hands. So there is it safe to assume that you know, most of you have seen tennis, all right, but you don't really, you know, not particularly interested, don't really know how it works, right? Actually, it doesn't really matter whether we talk tennis, <coughs> cricket, American football. When I speak to British audiences, usually I use American football because nobody gets that game, right? But it doesn't really matter. We could use Monopoly or in any game, really. Okay, so just imagine I'm going to ask you to come play some tennis with me. I give you a racket, I give you some balls. And we go into a tennis court. What are the chances are that we we'll probably have seen enough of tennis, we know a little bit about it, we know that actually probably best that one of us goes to one side of the net and the other one goes to the other side, right? We'll make that judgment. We'll probably do that, right? Even if we don't, we both go on one side, very quickly one of us will go, I'll tell you what, I'll go on the other side of the net, that seems like a bit more fun. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Second thing, if I give you a racket and balls, most of us know about, enough about rackets and balls to know which end of the racket to hold. We know balls bounce, and pretty much very quickly we figure out, and, and you know, if you want to see this with kids, give kids a racket and ball, guarantee within a few minutes they're putting racket to ball and they're hitting the ball somewhere, anywhere, but somewhere, right? Okay, so here comes the important thing, of course. So just imagine we're on the court and we're hitting the ball to each other. Okay, how long is that gonna go on for, before we get bored? Yeah, not very long, right? Probably 10, 15 minutes. At that point, when we get bored, what do, what's one of us bound to say? Let's move on. Let's move on. But what would move on look like? Okay. Obviously, we can go and have a beer, right? That could be one thing. But let's assume we were, you know, we were enjoying this game of tennis. What would we do? Right, right. We'd, we'd start to, probably one of us would say, let's play a game. Am I right? Yeah? So if we said, let's play a game, what do we need to know in order to play a game? What's the first thing you need to know? The rules, right? So it, given that we're none of us who are playing tennis, we actually don't know anything about tennis, I'm guessing we're going to have to make up the rules, right? We'd make up our own rules, right? It might not resemble tennis as we know it in the modern game, but we would make up a rule for this thing that we're calling tennis. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. So, but that's not enough, right? So we make some rules up, we work out where these lines are, where we can hit the ball and all that kind of stuff. But that won't be enough, right? Because very soon, we're going to need something else in this game. And what's that? We need to know how do we win, right? So we're gonna, somebody's going to win, we wants to win, right? This is a natural, innate human condition, right? Winning is very much part of who we are. And some of you might be going, well, I don't care about winning. Bullshit. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I'll take your bet right now. We, can, you know, we don't even have time to explore that, but I'm telling you now, nonsense, right? All of you care to win. Might, maybe some of you more than others, okay? Some of you unreasonably so. Some of you might be going to some extreme ends to win. But generally speaking, pretty much everybody cares about winning, right? And it's great to be part of a winning team and whatever that might be as well. But we need to know what winning looks like. And in order to know what winning looks like, we also need to know two other things. Anybody? Just think about tennis. What are we going to do? Yeah, we need to score points, right? So we're going to need to come up with some sort of scoring system. Would that be fair enough? Yeah? Okay, so we need to know the rules. We need to know what the scoring system would look like. We would know, need to know how many points at some stage we need to accumulate in order to win, right? And probably at the end of it, given who we are, we're going to go, okay, if I beat you, you've got to buy me a beer, right? So there's going to be some sort of reward, some sort of reason for playing, some incentive to play. Now, it might be that tennis itself is enough, but generally speaking, at some point, we go, I tell you what, if I beat you, then you buy me a beer or vice versa. Fair enough? Okay. So what we've got actually, if we think about it, the conditions for any game, whether it's a board game at Christmas, whether it's um, a tennis game, you know, between friends, or whether it's that game which we call business, it's all the same things, right? Because actually business is just a game. It's a very serious game, but it's just a game. If you think about it for a minute, a business actually has the same ingredients as any game, right? There's a playing field, the market, right? There are teams, companies out there. We compete against each other. There are rules, right? You can't just do whatever you want, right? We keep score. They're the financials of the business, amongst others. 
we keep score. And there are winning and there's winning and losing, right? We go out of business or we stay in business, we grow, we succeed, we, whatever the case might be. So what I'd like you to do for the second point that I want to make is I want you to think about your business as a game. And I want you to think about actually how many of those ingredients do you have in your business right now? Okay, if I walk into your business today and I said to any one of your employees, or maybe even all of them, okay, what does winning look like in this business? How many of them will actually be able to tell me? How many of them would absolutely tell me with some real clarity, with some confidence, what winning looks like? Absolutely, that's the problem. Okay, because if it is, what are they going to be doing? Right? They're going to be trying to chase what they think winning looks like. In other words, they're going to be the ones who make up the rules for this game called the business, or that is your business, right? Okay, or this new game of tennis that they've, they've just created, whatever it might be, right? So that's the main problem in business, right? The business owner has one idea of what's important at any particular stage, and they're trying to drive that, but everybody else doesn't know because we didn't tell them. We didn't ask them, we didn't invite them to consider the question, we didn't actually tell them what, what's winning look like. Okay, what's the critical number or numbers in your business? Because if they don't know that, guys, they can't play. Okay, if we don't know how, what winning looks like in your business, I can't play. Is that fair enough? Okay, so if you think about now, let's assume you've got 100 employees, and 50 of them actually have no idea what winning looks like. At least it's a different idea from what you think it is. 50 of them are not playing, period. Okay, so now we've only got 50. Right, so let's add the next, next condition. In. How many of those 50, the remaining 50, actually understand how your business actually makes money? In other words, your business model, the underlying business model. How many of them actually understand that? All right, because if they don't understand that, they know if they don't understand the rules of your game, whatever business you're in, they can't play. Okay, so let's go again. Let's say, right, let's assume that half of the 50 don't know the rules of your business, don't know your business model, don't know actually what, you know, how, how, to, how your business really makes money because you don't tell them and they're not educated or informed. So then let's assume that only 25 now can play. So out of 100 employees, only 25 are actually helping you. Is that fair enough? Okay, because if they don't know some of that stuff, they can't help you in time. They're trying. Okay, I don't know anybody who gets up, to, you know, comes out of, you know, gets up out of bed every day and goes to work and says, right, let me see if I can really make some bad decisions today. Okay, but the chances are that they do, but not typically willingly. But they do that because there's a lack of education and a lack of information. Right, so whenever you see problems, this is just a general comment, whenever you see a problem in your organization, I'm going to ask you, really, really, take one thing away from the session, this is it. Make sure, have a look and say, hang on a second, what education is missing and what information is missing for my business? Rather than saying, hey, this guy doesn't care. Okay, you know, you know, what's wrong with them? Are they stupid? You know, are they ignorant? What are the cases? Yeah, they probably are ignorant rather than stupid. Yeah? So in other words, they don't have information or education. If you want to fix things, focus on that level, and then you've got a shot. Okay, so, right, so now we've got 25 people that are helping us in our business of 100 people, right? Because they're the only people who actually know what winning looks like, and they're the only ones who know what, how your business makes money. Now, what about the third ingredient? The third ingredient actually is, is the scoreboard, right? We, no game would be fun without a scoreboard, am I right? There would be no point. Even if we knew the rules of the game, just hitting to the ball to each other is somewhat satisfying, but really not totally satisfying, right? The game becomes satisfying when you have a game and you know whether you're winning or losing at any particular point. So if out of those 25 people, only half of them actually know how to keep score, and more importantly, when we keep score, what that information actually means, then we've only got now 12 people who actually, out of the 100 people who actually might be able to help us in our business. If we said 50% of those would be able to follow a scoreboard. And what I mean by follow a scoreboard is, let me ask you the question directly. How many people in your organization, whatever size you are, if we put the, the simple income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow of your business down in front of them, could tell you what actually is happening in the business? Okay, anybody would go 100%. I've never had that question 100% answered, right? In fact, the answer in most questions is very, very few. Usually a small handful of people in any business actually can read basic financial information, right? So if they can't do that, never mind all the other key performance indicators and all that kind of stuff, if they can't read basic financial information, they can't play the game that is your business, guys. All right, so you have to think about how do we educate these people in your business because they're not, you're not helping them, right? So now we've got 12 people left. Now what about, what portion of that 12 do you think we might just hope actually know how to connect the days to day activities in their business to, uh, and, uh, to what it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah? So 
the most, hopefully it's just those 12, it's at least those 12, but what are the chances that any of them actually care? All right, so, you know, they don't care because necessarily, because they're not necessarily engaged or involved in new business, whatever the case might be, but more importantly, they don't care because actually there's nothing in it for them. All right, because we all want our employees to work really hard, right? We want them to care about their business, but we want them to love our business, but what's in it for them? All right, so there's got to be some sort of aspect of, you know, a reward, some result, reason for participating, what I call a stake in the outcome. Okay, a reason for playing, right? So I don't know how many of our 12 people we've got left now engaged in helping you build out this business, but the chances are it's not a big number. It's maybe half again, maybe six people. Okay, those six people, the chances of those six people out of 100 are probably the same people who are the management team. Right, yeah, why? Because actually they're the only ones who actually get the numbers in most businesses. The only ones you're likely to understand, some of them, if not all of them, and by the way, I've worked with some big, big blue chip businesses all over the world, and I can tell you very few of those senior managers in those businesses actually understand their own, the financials of their own business, by the way. Yeah, business literacy is a real issue. Okay, so there's business literacy and there's also financial literacy. You know, business literacy, how business actually works and makes money. Financial literacy, what you know, the income statement, cash flow and balance sheet actually says business, and what does that mean in terms of our decision making. Okay, so. What does it actually translate into your business? So what I'm saying here <clears throat> is that I want you to think about your business as a game. It's a serious game, yes. You know, you put your blood, your sweat, and your tears into it. It's really important for you. I believe that. Okay, but if you don't have a framework to think about your business, a way in which you can say, hey, what's going on here? What are the ingredients that I really need to fix? Then actually, where do you start acting? Right? The chances are you start to, whenever you see something going wrong, you try and intervene at a behavioral level. Okay, in other words, you call everybody together and you say, guys, listen, the, the, the sales are tanked this month. We've really got to get together. We've started, got, to, got together and started upselling. I know you can do it, right? You do the, your motivational bit. And everybody looks at you and says, yes, boss. And guess what happens next month? Same problem, okay? <laughs> All right. I, you know, or you call to everybody together and say, listen, guys, we must communicate better. And everybody goes, yes, boss, you're right. And guess what? Within two weeks, they go back to doing business the same way they've always done it. Right? Because that's kind of the habits, and old habits die hard. So if you are currently in a business and you're addressing the problems that your business is experiencing by appealing for a behavioral change, you're screwed. Okay, because you can't change behavior sustainably just by appealing for behavioral change, right? So what you have to do is you have to look at the underlying system, what I call the operating system, and I don't mean the software, the operating system of your business, how people come to meet every day, the policies, the practices, the procedures, how they talk about your business, the education you provide, the information you provide. You have to look at that and reconstruct that. Okay, and I'm gonna to suggest to you do, you do these five things, four things rather, okay? You make sure that everybody understands the rules of your business. Uh, then in other words, how your business makes money and how it competes. Everybody in your business needs to know that and you need to share that information, okay? You then need to actually make sure that everybody understands what winning looks like. What's the critical numbers in your business? What's the one or two things we absolutely have to nail this year in order for our business to succeed? At least, you know, if not do really well, at least don't go out of business, right? What is that number? And right now I'm hoping you're thinking for yourself, what is that number in your business? Okay, is it sales? Is it, uh, is it profitability? Okay, is it cash flow? If you're a small business owner, cash flow is probably one of those things you're worried about most months, right? Uh, is it customer satisfaction? So it's not always a financial number. Is it actually employee engagement, the way you, people engage you, uh, in your business as well? Yeah? So it could be a whole bunch of different things. And once you've got those two things in place, I want you to think about how do we actually share information with our staff? How do we build scoreboards where everybody can see every day how our business is doing? All right, now the chances are that you wanna, you're thinking right now, Hang on, I'm not sure I really want to share financial information about my business with everybody in my team. Okay, I'm going to tell you categorically, big mistake. All right, I've done this for 30 years. Okay, when you start to share the financial information in your team, you start to see extraordinary results. You know why? Because your people really do give a shit. Actually, they turn up every day and they put a lot of effort into your, your business. They actually care much more than you think and maybe even much more than it kind of looks like at times. All right, they really do care. Most people want to come to work every day and do a good job, as I said. Okay, very, very few people, and there's got to be some really significant reasons why they might get up and say, right, let me see if I can make some very expensive mistakes today. They just don't, okay? They really generally are trying, 
right? But if, they, if you give them the wrong information or give them worse, no information, guess what? They make up their own rules, just like we made up our rules when we played tennis, right? They make up their own scoring system. Yeah, they decide for themselves what's important. Okay, and when that starts to happen, you start getting people doing a whole bunch of different things in your business, and so your business now is not aligned. Everybody's not trying, pulling in the same direction. Does that make sense? Okay, and then the final thing you need to think about is actually how, if we get it all right, how do we reward ourselves for winning? How do we make sure that everybody is rewarded for the thing that we're trying to do? So that thing that we talked about, what winning looks like, you want everybody rewarded on that, right? Not just some sort of random compensation type plan, you know, um, incentive commission type plan, right? You really want them to focus on the thing that really is important for your business. And the chances are, and I've looked at this in lots and lots of businesses over many, many years, I've very, very rarely seen bonus programs or incentive programs that made any difference to the business at all. And, yeah, and cost the business a lot of money, by the way. Okay? So that's a really serious consideration. So I'm going to ask you to think about um, radically shifting the way in which you run your business. How do you actually create a situation where um, everybody comes to work every day thinking, feeling, and acting as if they own the business? And if you did that, actually, what are the ingredients that you might need to put in place to enable that? Right? Because if you do that, you're going to get address the real question. Um, you know, people will want to stay because they're having fun. Right? They'll want to stay because they feel part of the team that's starting to win. They'll want to stay because actually they feel important and involved and uh, that, uh, that the, uh, their ideas are taken seriously. Okay, all the things we talked a little bit about earlier. Right? And they'll want to stay because actually there's something in it for them. They have a stake in the outcome. Okay, whether it's a share of the profits at some point, or the, a bonus scheme, or whether actually it may even be equity participation. There may even be uh, opportunities for them to actually own some of that business of yours in one way or the other. Next week I'm going to spend two days at the Employee Owners Conference, uh, Owners Association just down the road here in, in Birmingham. Right? I'm speaking there and sharing some sessions and exhibiting and all the rest. I've been doing that for many, many years. So actually employee ownership is a really interesting idea too, but that's another day, another story for another day. Okay, so you might be thinking then, okay, so that maybe that makes sense. So anybody here thinking that's just a lot of tosh? That's a lot of rubbish. Don't believe in a word of what he's just said. And I don't want to, I won't be offended, so please put your hand up. It's no problem. Okay, anybody thinks this is re remotely interesting? Yeah? Okay, so there's plenty. I'm very happy, by the way, after the session, I'll be hanging around for several hours. If you find me, I'll be very happy to answer your questions, maybe related specifically to your businesses. So very happy. And I won't be looking to charge you for anything, so don't worry about that. Okay, just come and talk to me. Um, you might be thinking, okay, so this is a spa conference, but actually, is anybody in the spa business already doing it? Well, this is a company, who knows Becky Woodhouse, who knows Pure Spa? Yeah, okay, so Becky, uh, and you know, if you want to speak to Becky, any of you, uh, please come and get my uh, card, uh, let me arrange it for you. Um, she's very kindly agreed for me to just pop her name up here, um, but it'd probably be best if there's a, a context for you calling her. She's a very busy woman, as you know. Those of you who know probably know. But they've just, you know, they, they implement a lot of the ideas. So they use uh, daily dashboards every day. Um, so everybody in the business knows pretty much every day how the business is doing. Everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, okay, whether you're the most junior person in the organization or you're the operations director. Everyone in the business knows every day how we're doing as a business. Okay? Um, they have, you know, what, what we call gamification. I introduced that into organizations where we have a particular methodology for helping, uh, it's a sort of technology and approach to actually help you drive particular uh, aspects of your business's performance, uh, you know, in, over a short period. So that's the gamification idea. Um, they get everybody involved in the strategic planning and thinking for the organization. Um, and there's incentives and bonuses linked to the critical numbers in the business. So um, there's also a company in the U.S. called Ginger Bay Spa in Missouri. Again, extraordinary results using the same approach. So kind of really know it works here. But also, I can tell you, I, I consult for businesses all over the world, uh, and it works for pretty much in every business that I've ever worked in. So right now, you know, I'm, I'm putting it to work in London in a cake shop. They make five million pounds worth of cake every day. Beautiful cake, right? Um, and it's really changing the way they're running their business. I'm running it with a company that. Um, you know, prints uh, or creates uh, gravure cylinders for printing. I won't get into the details, you're not interested. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's changed the way that they, they put and so forth and so on. Engineering companies, software companies, all sorts of things. Okay, so um, that's pretty much me. So um, I don't know how long we've got left. Anybody here in, in, from an organizing position know anything? 
Okay, let's just wing it for a few minutes. Any questions that I can take um, before you get out of here? Hello. I found that very interesting. Um, Good. I've been tasked with um, writing the, our company values because although we have a reward system, yeah. we don't actually know yeah. what the rules are doing yeah. it. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. we found that a lot of younger people are coming into the company. I've been there for 14 years, so I've been tasked with this. Um, to write them. Okay, but good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the values conversation is critical, okay, yeah. but actually it doesn't add any value to your business, interestingly enough. All right? So here's the thing. Um, you have to have a values conversation, yeah. for sure. But actually, uh, I've never seen a set of values, whether they're stuck on the walls or whether they're sent around in, in uh, notes to people or whether we talk to people in meetings, I've never seen a set of values make any difference to a business. All right? And the reason for that is very simple, is because people don't know actually what that really means. Okay, we care for our customers. Yeah, but what does it actually look like, sound like, feel like every day? If we can take, if we can take the values conversation and turn it into a behaviors conversation, now it becomes useful for you. So I would really recommend you do that. Okay, so you have to, you know, basically the behaviors will reflect the values, but don't publish the values, publish the behaviors. Yeah, or do both, but at least publish the behaviors, yeah? Okay. Of course. Yes. Yes. Um, who have a high level of employment accountability and responsibility in terms and rewards all the things that you mentioned in terms of are these good examples to use where so we don't do it against each and every shareholder so we have the reward in terms of profit and says maybe not rewards in terms of incentives, but if your idea Yeah. I, I think um, they're both quite good examples of the importance of company culture. Okay, so what most people don't realize is that actually fundamentally it's all about culture. So when I talk about employee, uh, you know, ownership thinking, that's really talking about a culture of ownership in your business, right? But I can tell you as a consultant, if I go into any company and say, right, I want to talk to you about company culture, okay, nobody's buying. All right, because they go, well, that seems like soft and fluffy stuff. But they don't, many, most people, many people don't realize actually it's really everything that's important about a business fundamentally. Because culture is, is what fundamentally is repeated behavior, right? So what do you see being repeated in the business day in and day out fundamentally is the culture. I don't care what you call it. I don't care how you describe it. I don't care whether you spent, you know, three months putting a nice set of words on the wall. If people, nobody's doing it, it it's not, means nothing, right? There's, there's no, so the culture is pretty much the behavior that you see repeated in your business. The reason why Disney works is they manage to create a culture which is really all around their reason for being. Okay, their fundamental, fundamental mission is to make people happy. Yeah. yeah, and so they've somehow, the people they employ, they're obviously doing a good job of employing the majority of the people to be able to capture and reflect that. Yeah, and that becomes really quite important and probably there's a difference between them. I don't know anything about them in terms of how they bonus people, incentivize them, reward them or anything like this. I can't comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, John Lewis is actually is an employer-owned uh, owned, uh, company, as you know. I know them very well, um, and they do lots and lots of things right. They've got, in my in my uh, view, they've got lots of things still to do. But yeah, they do things a lot better for some reason. Yeah, but that's because they are employer-owned, so people do feel that ownership, uh, even though they may not always have the mechanisms for ownership. Anything else, guys? I think I'm I'm, I'm getting the throat cut signal, which I think I think means that you've got to get I've got to throw you out of here.